Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Before we go to the Lord in prayer, let me catch you up on a couple of things. One, we are doing like church conference and Lord's Supper today, mainly because your pastor is short-minded, and we should have done it last week, and I just got lost in the calendar. So we just bumped it all to today, so yay. All right, totally my fault, but I think it's going to work out. Um, I do want to tell you, like it mentions in the bulletin, the offering we're going to take, it's our quarterly benevolent offering fund. Uh, we are designating this one to help cover some expenses for the third grade at Northeast Elementary. We are going to uh, help get some students to a field trip that can't afford it and that's that's the main way that's going to be used um, so I just want you to know that and know that 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 relationship is is blossoming and really going well um, and it's awesome I just wanted you to be aware of it uh, our teacher for the week is Lori Scott so we're going to be praying for her we want to pray for this offering and the chance to to love some children and that the Lord get some glory for that I also want you to notice look at your order of worship in the song that we're about to sing O come O come Emmanuel and no it's not because we think that Christmas starts after Halloween, all right? Although it is kind of a taste of things that are coming. I want you to, when we sing it, pay attention to the words, all right? Because if you'll notice, the, the, the parable we're going to do today is a pair of the workers in the vineyard. It's about equality. It's about justice. It's about what the kingdom of God looks like when Emmanuel comes. And the words from that song are about Emmanuel coming and establishing the kingdom of God here and the equality and the justice that comes with it. So it's, it really is theologically setting the stage for what we're about to study. Uh, and that's really why it's there. The, the taste of Christmas that comes a little early is just for fun. But I wanted you to see that and notice it's kind of weird, and that, but it's, I think it has meaning to us. And it'll mean more to you if you knew what it, why it was there and what we're going to sing. So that said, let's go to the Lord in prayer and, uh, and continue to worship. My Father, it is so good to be here, and I'm thankful for this church family and our chance to worship together, to study your word together. I look forward to the Lord's Supper. We look forward to gathering around the table together in an act of worship and remembrance and obedience. We ask your blessings on what happens here. We ask your blessings on the message that is coming, this story that you would let it come alive for us. And you would teach us about what it means to be a citizen of your kingdom. We also ask your blessings on Lori, the work that she does, that you would give her energy and enthusiasm, fill her with patience and allow your spirit to flow through her to care for the students that you've entrusted to her. We thank you for the chance to care for students in this offering we're taking and that you would use that to open the door for gospel conversations. That they would know, not that the church has cared for them, but that you have cared for them and that you would be glorified in it and your gospel would be shared through. We give us opportunities to talk about you to these students and to their teachers. Father, would you grow your kingdom in and through us and our work. Guide us in that work to bring you glory. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll remind you of what I've told you for a couple of weeks that I set you up with this every week. We ask, we sing that song, Seek You First, and then we're going to open our time together uh, with the Lord's Prayer. We're going to emphasize and dwell on the fact that we ask the Lord to bring His kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. And then we're going to study God's Word, and I'm going to tell you what it is you just asked God to do. All right? So I'm making you ask it first before you realize it, uh, and just allow that to grow and challenge us. So would you, uh, as we well, just don't turn yet. We'll get there, all right? Let's start. Let's pray together. And if you would say the Lord's Prayer with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You're going to want to be in Matthew chapter 20. Uh, we continue a study through some parables that Jesus gives us all in Matthew uh, that we call kingdom parables. This is where uh, Jesus would start with the kingdom of heaven is like. That's Matthew's version. And then he tells us a story that gives us an idea of what the kingdom of heaven is like. And we are both learning some ideas about what the kingdom is and helping you understand, you know, what it is that you're a part of, 
But also, like, the, the main thought is the ethic of the kingdom of God. What does it mean to live as a citizen of this kingdom? If you're a follower of Christ, you call yourself a citizen of the kingdom of God that is already on earth and yet not fully realized. And this teaches us then, like, how are we supposed to live? There's kind of some marching orders that come out of these parables. And that's what we're going to find today in this parable. So read with me, Matthew 20. We'll start in verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day, and he sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out, and he saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again at noon, and about three in the afternoon, and then did, and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. And he asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. And he said to them, Will you also go and work in my vineyard? When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came, and they each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. And those who were hired last worked only one hour, they said. And you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, am I, not being un I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? So take your pay and go. I want to give to the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am being generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. You know, Thomas Jefferson once said, well, he wrote it, actually, and he was paraphrasing Aristotle when he say it, said it, that little seems more unequal than the equal treatment of unequals, right? Like, that, that just gets all over us. And this parable is designed to do this. It's designed to just get all over us because, and I just, I'm just going to make an assumption here, and you're just going to nod and tell me that I'm right, is that we naturally connect with the first workers, don't we? Like we naturally connect with those guys that were hired because we assume, yeah, I'm a hardworking person and I put in my hours and you hire me at six in the morning and I, I should get a full day's wage. But if the guy that gets hired at five in the afternoon gets a full day's wage, I should get a little extra, right? Because I put more hours in. We naturally, it's just, it's normal and it's okay. It's the way it's supposed to be. We naturally equate ourselves with the first guy that's been hired all day and now seems to have been mistreated. It's, it, and it, it is, it's, it's unfair, there is something unfair about that in our sense of what fairness means, and that's the point. Jesus wants us to connect with that first person. He knows that we're going to connect with that first person. He knows that you and I read this, and we don't like it. This is the parable we like to skip over because it speaks against our sense of fairness, and he does that because he wants to teach a lesson. And don't forget that. Right? Like, like we, this may be worth 10 seconds to think about coming in. That If we understand Jesus as, as Lord to me, He is my master, He is the one whom I've chosen to follow, and therefore I need to learn from Him, I look at this story and I know a lesson is coming, and I admit it's not a lesson I want, right? This is not a lesson I want. I do not want my concept of fairness to be redefined, and yet, if Jesus is Lord of my life, His lesson then is important to me. So we open our eyes, we open our ears, and we let him speak. Let's think about what this is. The lesson that Jesus teaches really is really simple. I'm going to kind of lay out the, the thesis for you on the front end. The lesson is that the kingdom of God that Jesus has inaugurated, right? It is already present. He announced it with the start of his ministry. It is not yet finished because it won't be finished till he comes back and finalizes it. That that kingdom of God creates equality and creates justice, that life within that kingdom is a life of equality and a life of justice. You think about how this plays out. This plays out in our entire concept of salvation. Matter of fact, this parable makes for a really good allegory of the idea of salvation, right? Because you and I are saved by Christ. Not by anything that we did, but because Christ is graceful. Now, some of you were like me. You got saved at seven. I was seven years old when I understood what Jesus wanted for me and accepted the grace that he had offered us. Some of you are 30, 40, 50 when you accept the grace that Jesus offered you. Some people wait until their deathbed, right? And we work and we do the best we can in that moment to lead them to Christ. And thankfully, some people respond in that moment. And yet our understanding of salvation is what? That all of us are equally saved. 
the grace that is given to me at seven is the same grace that is given to the murderer on his deathbed at the end of his life. All of that grace is the same. I had a deacon once say this to me. I couldn't believe he actually said it. He, he, he expressed to me really clearly that he didn't think that was fair. He said, I'm, this isn't fair. I've been a Christian my whole life. I've been acting good my whole life, was the words that he said to me. Then it's not fair that these deathbed people get the same, get the same Jesus as I did. And I, it was one of those political moments where I just kind of, I kind of bit my tongue and maybe I shouldn't have, right? If I'd have been an older, wiser man. But I didn't say anything back. At first I was like, wow, he's admitting what we all feel. All right? So like, let's be honest. We all kind of feel that way. I've been good my whole life, right? Don't I deserve a little extra Jesus? And yet, that's exactly what this parable speaks to, isn't it? He was speaking what you and I feel and connecting to that first person, and then so clearly speaking against what it is that Jesus is trying to teach us that, hey, there's the red flag. There's something we have to listen to here. Our understanding of salvation in the kingdom is that grace is grace, and it doesn't matter at what point or at what age that grace is given to you. You receive grace. All are saved and then made equal in the kingdom of God. This lesson, uh, this parable also plays out with the idea about you and I being included in the kingdom at all, because every one of us are pagan Gentiles, right? You're a pagan, your parents were a pagan, your grandparents were a pagans. We are not Jewish by heritage and therefore not supposed to be, at least, included in the kingdom. And yet, God chooses to include us. And this becomes an incredible lesson to Jesus' Jewish brothers and sisters, to the Jewish audience that reads Matthew. Matthew wrote primarily to a Jewish audience to understand like the inclusion of the Gentiles is good. Yes, we are late to the party. Yes, you have been there the whole time because your great, great, great grandparents were there when Moses brought the law down from the mountain, but it doesn't change the presence of grace. And it's a lesson about you and mine inclusion into the kingdom of God and how that's not just okay, it's a good thing. The, the whole point of this story, at least on, at the, at the, in the large picture, is for us to stop connecting with the first person and feeling sorry for him and thinking ourselves that, that we're somehow being mistreated because we're not being paid extra and instead be able to celebrate the guys that are hired at the end of the day. To look at this guy who works just an hour, maybe two hours in the day, and yet still receives a day's wage to be able to care for his family. To not feel sorry for us, but instead to celebrate that person. Think about how that plays out then in ethics for us. Because like, if the kingdom of God establishes that sense of equality and a sense of justice, and, and it redefines justice, we're going to talk about that, that it creates that equality that is there that speaks against our natural sense of normal and of justice, that throws itself then in the face of a world that you and I live in that is not equal and that is not just. That's why this seems unfair to us, because we come from a world that that, just, that doesn't sound right, because from our worldview, it's not. So what does that mean for you and me, living as citizens of a kingdom that calls for equality and for justice, living in a world that does not understand what that looks like? It's an understanding of like what our job is. And we've been talking about this now for several weeks. Like Our job, our, our calling as citizens of the kingdom of God is to participate in bringing about the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. That's literally what you just asked God to do. That's the mission that he has given to us, to be a part of establishing his kingdom here on earth like it is in heaven. So we're making, we, we, we have a responsibility, and we're going to learn some ethics from this, of creating a sense of equality and of justice in a world that is very not equal and very not just. So the ethic that comes for you, what it means to live as a citizen of, a king, of this kingdom of God, means the creation of equality, the redressing of imbalance, th seeing things that just aren't right. And making efforts to make them right, or what I would, the best way for me to understand it is the restoration of people. To see people who have who are fallen, that's our salvation language, right? Who are broken, who have been mistreated, or even have just made bad decisions and are having to live in it, and helping to restore them to life, to a quality of life. Which is what the master does in the story. In this story, the, the, the master has generosity to the latecomers. And I need you to think about, like, put yourself in their shoes. And that's the whole point of the parable is you've got to put yourself in the shoes of the players of the story. We naturally equate with the first guys, but put yourself in that other guy's shoes who stood out there all day. It's now 5 o'clock. 
The day ends about six o'clock. They work longer than we do now, right? It, except for you, Brian. I know you work all day. So <laughs> we were joking about that earlier. Um, the day's almost over, and he's not worked. And especially in that world, if you don't work, what do you also not do? Eat. Which means he is an hour away from going home to his wife and children and saying, sorry, y'all get water for supper. Because I failed. I did not get work today. I did not make my denarius. I have failed in my responsibility to care and to provide. He's a failure. And his family is going to suffer because of that failure. I need you to equate yourself with that. Put yourself in that man's shoes and how terrible that is. They... And what this master does for him, he gets work. He gets a sense of, of purpose of, okay, there's still a value in you. Yes, you've been standing there all day, and we can have lots of conversations as maybe they're lazy, maybe they were hiding, maybe he deserved to be staying there all day, but that's not really the point of the story, is it? The point is that after standing there all day, the master comes and invites him to work and helps remove shame from him. The shame of walking away from the employment line, not finding a job. The shame of coming home to a family and saying, I'm sorry, I have nothing to give you because I could not secure work today, and the ability to provide for their families. Here is a broken man that cannot fulfill the thing that he needs to do with that day. And this master in his generosity restores him, gives him dignity, removes his shame, and then of course provides for him and for his family. We put ourselves in that man's shoes and we see the grace of the master. We see the generosity of the master. We see what it is that God has actually done for all of us and yet still look back to the first guys and be like, man, that's just not right, is it? That just is so unfair. The truth is, it just seems unfair. Because you and I define fairness from a world that is not defined as the kingdom of God. It seems unfair because our sense of, of what we would call fairness or justice is world-based, meaning that like, it, it, this is normal. This is the normal thing that you and I understand is that I get what I earn, Right? If I work eight hours, I should get paid for eight hours. I've always thought this, you know, if you go to school and you get an education and then you work eight hours, you should get eight hours of pay plus a bonus because what? You got educated, right? Or you got a skill. You should get, you should be rewarded for the work that you put in, that work then. This is where our understanding of, of, of equality and justice comes in is that work determines your worth. How much I work determines how much money I make, determines how worthy I am, how good a job I do, determines how much the boss should be paying me, whether I've gotten the degree or just I'm a good worker, whatever it is, that my worth and my value is determined by how much or how hard I work or how much I can produce for the company or for whatever it is that I'm working in. That's the norm for us, which is why we look at the first guy and we see, yeah, he produced more. He didn't just bring in an hour's worth of, of crops. He brought in 10 hours or 12 hours worth of crops. Shouldn't he be paid a little bit more? That's why it seems unfair because our definition of justice and of fairness comes from the idea that work determines worth. But in the kingdom of God, that's not what determines our worth, is it? My ability to produce is not what determines my worth to Christ or to His kingdom. So it, it, it creates then this new ethic for us, a new way in which we're supposed to live. This parable shows a new kingdom concept of justice that creates balance, that creates a sense of equality, that, that brings about restoration and a new sense of fairness. It redefines for you and me what justice is and what fairness is. There's a reason why we read the story and we're like, man, that seems unfair because that's what we've been trained to do. And now Jesus is retraining us. He says, you're a citizen of a different kingdom and the definition of justice is changed. The definition of fairness is changed because I don't want anything to do with the kingdom of God if I get what I deserve, right? I deserve death. I don't deserve grace. I do not deserve salvation. I do not deserve the kingdom of God. And if we can't stay on that sense of ethic and fairness, then we're all doomed. Thankfully, the master changes the definition of justice. So the kingdom of God that we live in and work to bring about has to then work out and play along this new line or new definition of justice. And here's where we get to have fun with. And this is the nerd part of me, but it's going to be great. 
that whole idea derives from what we call the year of Jubilee. Now, I, I, let's just have some, y'all do this for me. If you have ever studied, thought about, or heard of the year of Jubilee, raise your hand. I just want to know. Because I'm betting it's not that many. Yeah, like maybe half, right? Which I think is awesome because that, our, I th honestly, I think this congregation is pretty well educated. And I love that. Yay. Yay for the guys that came before me. But here's the thing. Most of us don't because it's not something we talk about. It's not something we want to read about. It's a whole passage from Leviticus that we skip over because the year of Jubilee scares us to death. It, it, it scares us so much that in the hundreds of years that Israel existed after God brought them the, the law in Leviticus, they never once practiced the law that tells them to practice this year of Jubilee. It was never done. It has never been done. This law that is so clearly laid out that God expected from His people called the year of Jubilee has never been done. You want to know why? Because it's crazy. Because it's unfair. Because it goes against what we understand as, as, as right. Look with me. Just, just indulge me. I want you to go back to the book of Leviticus. All right, Leviticus chapter 20. Now we're going to roll through this real quickly. I, mainly because I want you to be able to see this and then write it down. You can go back and read it again you know, later more in depthly. But I'm sorry, I said 20. Leviticus 25. But I want to show, like, highlight some pieces to you so you get a basic concept of what the year of Jubilee is. I would call it a disturbing but vital part of the Old Testament covenant. And it's essentially the uh, Sabbath day. It's the concept of Sabbath blown up over the course of a whole year. It's something that Israel never wanted to do because it's crazy. If you look in Leviticus 25, uh, matter of fact, the, the title for mine and the way it's, it's, it's called the Sabbath year, and then it rolls down in what it calls the year of Jubilee. But in Leviticus 25, you start, say, in verse 10, he says, Consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all of its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. Each of you's return to your family property, to your own clan. The 50th year shall be a jubilee. Don't sow, don't reap what grows of itself or harvest the untended vines. They were supposed to just stop. That's the whole idea. Every 50 years, you don't work. You take a Sabbath day for an entire year. That in itself is crazy, because then how do, you, how do you feed, right? How do you eat? How do you provide for your family? How do you keep stuff up? But whatever, that's what the law says. Every 50 years, don't do anything and allow the whole world to have a, a moment of Sabbath. But keep going. It gets worse. Verse 23, the land must not be sold permanently because the land is mine, and you reside in my land as foreigners and strangers. Throughout the land that you hold as a possession, you must provide for the redemption of the land. All right, now we're getting touchy. If one of your fellow Israelites becomes poor and sells some of their property, their nearest relative is to come and redeem what they've sold. If, however, there is no one to redeem it from them, but lay as they prosper and acquire sufficient means to redeem it themselves, they are determined the value for the year since they sold it and refund the balance to the one to whom they sold it. They can then go back to their own property. Basically, if you buy somebody's land and they find the ability to buy it back from you, you're required to sell it back. So everything that I've acquired, if you get the money, all of a sudden you can come and get it back from me because it was yours to start with, right? That's kind of the idea. But if they don't acquire the means to repay, what was sold will remain in the possession of the buyer until the year of Jubilee. It will be returned in the Jubilee and they can then go back to their property. Did y'all just catch why it is that Israel never actually did this? Every 50 years, the landowners, which we would understand as the decision makers, right? And that's that because we still do that. Guys who own the land are the guys who make the decisions. That's the way it works. That's, that's life and society for us. The landowners, the people who had acquired land and acquired wealth, either from great business practice or just plain luck, whatever, Every 50 years, they were required to give it back. So some guy loses his land. He makes a bad business decision and goes into debt and has to sell it. Or he just gets bad luck. Something terrible happens and his land gets taken away. Or you know, a bad decision. It doesn't matter. However, whatever calls him to lose his land, every generation, every 50 years, his family gets it back. It's just given back. That sounds incredibly unfair to the guy who bought it, doesn't it? To the one who has pursued the wealth and has done all the right things, made all the smart business decisions, and he's taken his five acres and has turned it into 500 acres because he's made all the right decisions, and every 50 years it starts over and you're back to five. That sounds unfair, but keep going. Go down to, like, say, verse 53. 
it's talking about those who have been, now we skipped a couple of verses, but in the year of Jubilee, it's talking about those who, who, who were slaves. And a slave for them was not like you and I understand, where I just go capture somebody and make them do what I want. A slave was a business decision. If I go into debt and I can't pay the debt, then I'll work the debt off for you. So any form of slavery in that world was just was basically a debtor's prison. You worked until that debt was paid off. So this is going to tell you what you do with them. They are to be treated as workers hired from year to year. You must see to it that those to whom they owe service do not rule over them ruthlessly. Even if someone is not redeemed in any of these ways, they and their children are to be released in the year of Jubilee. For the Israelites belong to me as servants. They are my servants whom I brought out of Egypt. I am Yahweh your God. Do you see the, the, the wide-reaching thing that the year of Jubilee is? Every 50 years, the whole society was reset. Any land that you had lost, you got back. Any land that you have purchased, you gave back. Anybody who is in debt to you, meaning that like you loaned them $100 and they couldn't pay it back every 50 years, yep, you don't owe me anymore. Right? It's just free. You get to start over. I have to start over. Whichever way you want to look at it, the point was that every 50 years there was a restoration of balance. And the whole idea was derived from theologically is that the land belonged to God and the people were all the servants of God so they can't indefinitely be servants to anyone else. That's the kind of the, the theological thought behind it. But these were all about the cancellation of debts, the recreation of balance within their society, of equality, and essentially, the, uh, to me, the biggest part, the restoration of people, of a man, a woman, a family, whatever it was, that has fallen on hard times. It doesn't matter if it was outside forces or their own stupidity. Every generation gets a start over, gets restored. It's, it's by definition, is what we would call new beginnings. It's a new beginning every 50 years and you can see why they never did it you can see why the guys who've acquired everybody else's five acres said you know what we're just not going to do that we're just going to skip over that part and they just would cut leviticus 20 out 25 out and, and move on it was crazy giving back land that's the forgiveness of a debt giving back money or releasing a slave that's the forgiveness of a debt it's almost like it's the same language we use for salvation where I have a debt I cannot pay. And by the grace of the master, it's forgiven. It's covered over. And I get a new beginning. It's crazy. It sounds crazy. Because it is crazy. It goes against everything you and I understand as fair. But this is the kingdom of God. It's not our kingdom. It's not life by the way we've designed it or the rules in which we created it. This is ethics and life defined by God Himself. And therefore, this is the ethic of the people of God. This is what God expects us to do. This is the way in which we are supposed to live, to be focused on not on my own development and self-value, but on the restoration of people and the creation of equality and of justice. This is how God instructed His people to live. This is how God fixed the inequality that was the result of sin and of bad decisions and just life. Life. Sin was in the world. He knew it was going to mess us up. And he created a system for them every 50 years to, to fix it, to start over and give people a new chance where debts were remitted, slaves were set free, people were economically restored. And I need you to think, like this year of Jubilee that sounds so crazy to us and terrifying, this is God's definition of justice. This is the definition that God uses to understand justice where He creates the sense of equality where there wasn't any. Where sin has created inequality and an imbalance in society, His idea of justice and of making that right was to reset things and to put everything back. This, that's gorgeous. It's beautiful, especially if you're the one who's lost everything. But you and I have the problem then of thinking about that and figuring out how to then translate that to the kingdom of God. And how you and I live in a world that doesn't think that way, right? That doesn't believe that at all. And how do we live like that in this world? In Luke chapter 4, Jesus comes. And if you were to, to read that passage, it's, it's Luke's version of Jesus, the start of his ministry. And he quotes a passage from Isaiah. And he inaugurates his ministry, which we already understand. That's the beginning of the kingdom of God. He comes and he says, behold, the kingdom of God is here. But he does it by reading a passage from Isaiah that was a declaration of Jubilee. 
Luke, it's Luke 4, verse 16 through 21, if you want to look at it. Jesus defined the coming of his kingdom as the reality of Jubilee. And he's looking at all of his people around him. He's looking at all these Pharisees. He's looking at all these landowners and says, guys, I've been telling you to do this for hundreds of years. And you haven't. And I don't know why. Well, he did know why. But now I'm establishing it. The kingdom is here. Which means the rules and the ethics of the kingdom are here. Which means the year of Jubilee has come. The ethics of the kingdom of God is the realization of the year of Jubilee on earth. It's you and I helping to bring about Jubilee here. So you think about what Jesus did. Is he, he brought the year of, G, of Jubilee to reality and he creates it as a perpetual ethic in the kingdom of God where we care more about the restoration of humans, the creation of equality, the bringing about uh, of, of restoration for fallen and hurt people than we do about our own worth and value and development. Which brings us back to our parable, to these workers out in the vineyard. Jesus starts the story for the kingdom of heaven is like. He's telling us that life in this new kingdom that he has established, it's not about pursuing wells. It's not about making myself better. It's not even about making sure that I get treated fairly. Life in this kingdom is about the giving of grace. It's about generosity. It's about the fixing of imbalances and the creation of equality in a world that actually pursues another way. It's about restoring people and doing it through graciousness and gracefulness and generosity. And what you and I then have to do, and this is where Jesus' lesson like kicks us right in the face, but he's Lord and we have to listen to and accept it, is recognizing what seems to us as so radically unfair to those first couple of guys is not unfair because fairness and justice has been redefined. Our understanding now of fairness and justice is not, I get what I deserve and I get what I've earned because if that were true, then we're all doomed and I don't get to go to heaven. I don't want that. So my understanding and definition of what justice is, of what fairness is, has been redefined as an act of grace, as an action of generosity where the master is gracious and generous beyond what we deserve and then looks at me and says, you're going to be the same. I've given you grace you don't deserve and therefore I expect you to act with grace that you did not deserve. Justice is no longer me getting what I deserve. But instead, kingdom justice is about the restoration of people, the correction of unfair treatments, the suppression of the poor, the creation of equality on earth. This, this is what it means for us to be about thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, the truth is, this may mean for you and I, as citizens of this kingdom, that we may experience unfairness and injustice by the world's definitions so that justice can be done for others by the kingdom's definition. That means it's possible and actually called on, on, in many, for on us on, in many places to give up wealth and status that we have earned. Yeah, you went and got it and you earned it, but we give it up. Why? To create equality for those who don't have it. To help restore someone else that doesn't have it. That's why we do an offering. That's why we give a tithe. That's why we're going to give a benevolent offering in a minute to help someone who can't do it. And we can. It may mean us living a life of sacrifice to which we are called for the good of others. This is life in this kingdom. This is what it means to be a citizen of this kingdom. This is why, this is, this is what, you, what, what we mean when we say that kingdom come. We're asking God to establish his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, knowing that that completely redefines the concept of fairness and of justice. And in many times that may call for a temporary sacrifice on our part for the benefit of others as an act of grace and of generosity that reflects the grace and generosity that Christ has given to us. I want you to think about the fact that we're about to take the Lord's Supper. And that's going to start us into our church conference and, and we'll take a couple minutes to do any business that may come up after that. But Not only does this set the stage for the conference, the, the, the business thing that we need to do, but it actually is an excellent example of the, the biblical concept or the kingdom concept of grace and of equality that we just read about. Because you and I get to gather around this table and we get to do it together. 
some of you have been Christians longer than I've been alive, but I get to sit at the table with you. Some of me, well, I'll just say it, I'm a much more sinner than many of you are. <laughs> but I get to sit at the table with you. You think about around this table, there's no hierarchy. No one sits higher, no one sits closer. We all sit equal at the foot of the cross and in the grace of Christ. That is it. That is a perfect illustration of this difficult lesson that Jesus just taught us, that in this kingdom everything's changed and our understanding of fairness and of justice has been redefined because it's all defined then by Christ and what he's given to us. I'm going to say a word of prayer, and then I'm going to ask our deacons that are serving to come forward, and we're going to just move right into our act of the Lord's Supper, uh, and we'll continue our worship in that way, and then move to a few minutes of business before we close. Father, I'm thankful for this story, I, and that's hard to say, because I don't like it. I don't like it. But I trust it, because I trust the one who said it to me. I trust that when I pursue your definition of fairness and of justice, I trust that you are going to care for me and provide for me, that when I sacrifice and when I give to care for someone else or to help someone else, that, that you're going to provide and you're going to take care of it. And that even if you didn't, we would do it anyway because you told us to. And we trust you that much. I ask your blessings on the elements that are in front of us, that the symbolism that is there, the, the very presence of your grace would be real for us as we take it, as we share it, as we do it equally as a family, and that the, the symbolism of that would be a stark contrast to the inequality of the world we live in, and would give us an impetus and a calling to care for those who are lost and who are not sitting at this table with us. We ask that you would bless the, the ritual that we're about to do, that you would inhabit it, that you would be glorified by it. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen.